Everything. Oh, let's start over. Me. Liz, we're so glad you're here. We've been a big fan of your, your color palette, your sense of geometry, as Luke said, your style. Very stylish. I won't show you the acid wash pants I'm wearing right now, but thank you. <laughs> I saw them and they look amazing. There's nothing like an elastic band at the bottom of a pair of... I know. My other pants were too tight and I'm like, I can't do a presentation if I'm that uncomfortable. Take off the tight jeans, embrace the big yeah. acid yeah. wash You're pants. You're on Zoom, <laughs> not stage. Um, so while everyone is rolling in, what we were thinking about asking today, uh, just sort of give us where you're from, anything else you want to shout out, of course, but also uh, how you design your quilts. How do you go from idea into kind of the actual thing? I mean, Libs is known for using the computer. Uh, Heidi is known for using whatever she can find in front of her, <laughs> you know, and it's sort of, uh, so how do you go from kind of idea through, like, do you use a pencil, paper, computer, all that stuff? So just shoot that in the chat, say hello, let us know where you're from, and good morning and welcome. I'm so happy to see Donna's in the audience, and I hope you're coming to my exhibition this weekend. I'll be sharing more about that. Um, yeah. Paper yeah, and paper. Plan a quilt I kind of anti-plan, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I've been I just planning more than I. I try to like not think about um, getting too deep in a game of chess. Just one step at a time, right, Heidi? Mm -hmm. You'll, you'll thinking, make the path that you want. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to plan the one that I'm working on now that I'll be sharing with y'all today. I've had to do a lot more planning because it's lettering and text and you want to make sure everything fits in. You don't want some word yeah. hanging off the side of your quilt, you know? So if I do mm. a little more planning than normal, which involve paper and pencil. It's beautiful. Or they're digital, I, the, I should say. I'll say together. Thanks. Yeah. It's looking really good. And I got some pictures I haven't shared yet before, so. I'm excited. Be excited. Mm -hmm. So I'm an over planner for sure. I mean, I come from architecture, so we use every trick in the book, paper, pencil, computer, generate, just whatever it takes to get it out there. And, you know, my, my goal over the past decade has been to do less planning. I've been taking pages out of Joe Cunningham's book and just, uh, you know, not his literal book, but his sort of figurative book and trying to kind of do it on the fly. And it's been really fun and very twitchy for those of us who are planners to not know exactly where it's going. Kate in Delaware yeah. makes it up as she goes along. Nice. I definitely need a balance between, you know, chaos and heavy duty planning for the execution of the actual quilt. So <laughs> I have a little, a balance of both. My friend, Laura Brown just said she goes by intuition. Ooh, well, I like that. Yeah. It would be so nice to break free and try to get out of the box and do the things that we're uncomfortable with and <laughs> do something like that. I would like to do that. Yeah. This is graph paper and a pencil. Libs and I are streaming uh, an in-person class sometime for whenever we make it happen. And maybe we'll be a, maybe we'll just make that our rule. Like, okay, we're going to do everything differently. Come join us. <laughs> yeah, we'll do the opposite of what we normally do. Right, right. Come come watch us flail and be and have a good time. <laughs> we'll teach you how. Yeah. It'll be, yeah, it's going to be exciting. I'm excited about that. Juta is going to see me in Switzerland next month. Hi. Ooh. I'm excited to finally see you in person again. Shall we introduce ourselves? do it. Sure. I'm Zach, if we haven't met yet before. Howdy. I'm coming to you live from Montana, where I have family, although normally I'm coming from other places. I don't know. The last few months of my life have been a little bit tumbleweedy, and I'm all right with that. Feels good. Next, I'll be tumbleweeding down to LA, where I'll be house-sitting for Luke Haynes. Do I get to hang out with Honeydew, Luke? Unfortunately, for a couple of days, but she's going to be in the, in the spa while we're gone. All right. Anyway, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm rolling around the country, crashing with friends, new artist residencies. I make repurposed quilts, how to repurpose materials. And lately I've been doing a lot of lettering, especially for the project I'll be sharing with you today. Heidi? 
Um, I am coming to you from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, especially if you're new to me. I do a lot of hand piecing and hand quilting, but um, like we were just saying about teaching the opposite, I've got a machine piece and quilt happening at QuiltCon in Atlanta, Georgia, and that was my first class to sell out for QuiltCon. So I do do a mix of things. I'm known to pick up a sewing machine from time to time. I do a lot of improvisation, a lot of diary, storytelling, memoir. Um, many of my helps dig into the realm, many of my quilts dig into the realm of self-help and repair and uh, in inquiry, self-inquiry. Uh, and I love to teach quilting online and in person and love to exhibit quilts as well. Luke? Good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, depending on where you are. There's people from everywhere. Uh, as Zach said, we're holding down the, the four kind of um, time zones <laughs> here for us. So hello from the west side. Um, I live in California, and I am a recovering architect turned quilter. Uh, my work, if you don't know it, a lot of figural work. Um, and I've been doing a lot more kind of um, beds for uh, quilts for function lately, which has been uh, a fun thing to sort of turn turn on its head everything I've done in sort of career-wise. So I've been having a good time with that. So Luke Haynes, Libs. Hey, everybody. I'm Libs Elliott. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm coming to you live from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Um, and I've been quilting probably since 2009. But from 2012 onwards, I've been making what I call generative quilts. So a lot of quilts that are designed using um, a computer program um, where my designs are randomly generated. And then I actually take the digital design and I build it out into a physical quilt. Um, so that's part of what I do. I also teach. I also design fabrics and design quilt patterns. And this has just been a whole big wild journey for the last 10 years. So I'm excited to share a little bit about that with you today. <laughs> and we're looking forward to hearing about it. Yeah. Um, right in front of me, if I had to flip the camera around, there's a street. So a truck was going down, I'm muted. And since I've been out here for just like 10 minutes, two deer have already walked right in front of me. So I may flip the camera around at some point and show you some your action. Life in Montana. Well, Lib, thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to hearing what you got as far as how your process goes. Today, I want to be sharing with you a quote that you've probably seen on social media because I've been hand sewing 67 letters, so it's been taking a while. Here it is in real life. This is the fine print. There are other letters on this quilt that are much bigger. Um, and I kind of want to walk you through not only the process for this quilt, but some other texty quilts that I've made. So here it goes. If you have any questions while I'm sharing, you're welcome to type in the chat. I'll try to keep a side eye on that one. All right, so here we go. Heidi, you can see the screen? You can see my slides? Sure can. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, let's begin. So I've been thinking a lot about hand lettering quilts um, for the last month, working on this quilt for the folk school. And so I pulled together three other quilts that I've done in the past that also have similar techniques and some that are divergent from that, just to give you an, an idea of how it can work. And I think a lot about so much of uh, planning this quilt reminds me of sitting at the kitchen table with my mom when I was in elementary school and like having to like make posters for, for a different class or for a science fair or something like that and having to like plan out how letters are going to go. And so she showed me a way way back when that makes it you just kind of wing it, but you also kind of plan it. It's like 50-50. And so this is how I'm able to make sure things are going to fit with also without getting too caught up in like tracing patterns and things like that. So one of the big texty textiles I've made, you may have seen it floating around Instagram this week because it's on display at the uh, Festival of Quilts in Birmingham is, and this is why America can't have nice things quilt. And of course, when I'm thinking of nice things, I'm not actually thinking about things because we got plenty of things in this country, but we could use a little more, I don't know, free and fair elections. We could use some universal health care, single payer, ideally. We could use a little more equity for everybody that lives on this planet, among other things, just to name a few. And so the letters that you see here, 
were hand cut and then needle turned down. I'll show you some close ups and you can see that. The quilt top was given to me by Roderick Kirikoff. So this was done by an unknown maker, probably back in the forties or fifties, judging by the fabric. And then I, I sewed down the letters and then did some hand ties with some purple yarn. Good soft bulky shot. There's the old America quilt. This one is documenting the first 100 days of the last president of the United, the former president of the United States. And pulling from thoughts I was having at the time, headlines at the time, all of that. These are what my mom would call fabric posters. The flag in the middle is removable so that it can be used in different actions. Here's some examples for you. I got really good at working with texture in this chunk of my creative journey just because uh, I was doing so much, so much of it. Here's a technique that I, I'm sure was also inspired by my mom because she came to visit me in New York at that time. And she was, is a calligrapher. And so she came and spent about a week and then left. And then after she left, I got this idea for taking like black shoestring essentially, and then sewing it down in kind of this calligraphic approach that you see here. Elizabeth Warren speaking her mind. And so this is just some of the ways I've used letters. In the week, in the news this week also, you may have uh, heard that down in Mexico, there's been a huge step for justice, a huge first step, by no means a last step, uh, when it comes to the fates of the 43 education students that disappeared eight years ago. Um, there's been a lot of um, secrecy, there's been a lot of resistance, there's been a lot of um, cover up by the government. But just this week, they arrested the former attorney general who is believed to be in charge of a lot of the cover up. And so it feels good to see things progressing in a certain way. The quilt that you see here on the screen is huge. It is, um, it, it is a quilted protest banner. And we made this back, I believe it was 2016. So just under two years after these 43 disappeared. And I asked for people, different quilt artists to come together and create a block for each one of the 43 students disappear. And you see their names on the screen. And it was interesting to me looking at these names just today, because I hadn't looked at them in, a, in several years, and just think, oh, so many of these people are still in my life. And so many of these people are, um, I should say, looking at the list of the makers, the names of the makers. So many of these people are still in my life. Um, and, it's, and it's fun to think about how that's changed over time. Take a look at some of the closer, though, because we're here to talk about text. Here you can see different things. People were using embroidery, they were using applique. A lot of, if you look in the top right corner, you can see the, the sweet little, um, what do they call those, prairie points, something like that, to spell out Jorge Alvarez Nava. Here you can see, I believe Nancy Purvis made the Felipe block on the left. And I believe Victoria Gertenbach made the Jose Luis block with the kite. So all kinds of approaches. There's Heidi's block. She did a portrait. And so it's just so powerful. Using text makes a quilt so specific. that It removes ambiguity, right? In a way that images leave a lot of room for interpretation, but text gets us down to a fine point. And that's one of the things I enjoy about including it in quilts. Here's a social thought experiment quilt that I made. Great grandmothers, how do we get there from here? This was a quilt that my mom gave me for Christmas one year. A lady had given it to her at a yard sale and Roderick and Coulter both helped me date it. And we think it's the, probably the 1860s, 70s, somewhere in there. So an old quilt. And being able to put a date on this quilt made me start thinking more specifically about the hands that went into making it. Cause you know, if you can get it down to a decade or two, you can begin to think about what was life like? Were they hand sewing or were they using one of those newfangled sewing machines that just hit the market, right? Were these natural dyed or were they synthetic dyed fabrics? And here you can see, it was pretty tattered when I got it. I did some light mending, but not too much. That's because this quilt's lived a life, it's allowed. And again, I just rough cut these letters and applicate them down. It's the planning that's the fun part, just a little bit. And I love those that knee of a pair of jeans stuck right there. So those are some of the quilts that I've made before this most current one, the one I'm working on now, the folk school quilt. And so it started with, of course, picking out the color palette. I knew what I wanted was a very low volume back, 
So I tried to pick tones of colors that were very similar to one another. Those would be the bottom four fabrics that you see there in the stack. And the text was gonna be of a higher contrast, higher volume pink. So those are the top two. I just whipped this out. I mean, honest, I mean, this part, I just cranked this out on a sewing machine, had it done in an afternoon. You know, this is not where the, the work was gonna be because I knew I wanted to put so much text over it. And so here is me realizing that I had done some paper and pencil sketches of this quilt, but I had not realized that there were three T's stacked on top of one another. And I was like, oh God. Also, if you look on the right, it spells out the word deer, but you know what? Can't do anything about that now. That's kind of fun. Maybe it makes it feel like a word search. Here's a shot of one of the hoops I was using in the beginning. I've since moved over to another one that I like better, but that's a cute shot. There's the finished quilt top. Good to be together. So the folk school every year has a fall festival. And for every fall festival, they make a quilt banner that hangs up prominently in the entryway when you come in. And so this is gonna be the first one since the pandemic happened. So it's, it's uh, I wanted to really make clear that it is good to be together, that being in a physical space together is something that maybe we've taken for granted before. Um, but now that we've come to see in many ways can be very, very valuable. And so this is the quilt top. It's gonna to be hand tied. I've got some pink yarn that I'm gonna tie it together with. And as just a fun little supplement, the picture I'm about to show you, I took last night as the sun was setting. What I wanna to do to honor the fact that we are all in this physical space. And on average, fall festivals at the folk school get 14,000 people. So just keep that number in mind. But 14,000 people are gonna come through the doors here. And to honor the fact that we're going to have so many people together in the same physical space, I wanted them to be able to sign the quilt. The problem with that, though, is that the quilt's going to be on display. So how do they sign something that's hanging up? So I came up with the idea of doing a line drawing of the quilt itself on a large piece of muslin. And that will be on a tabletop underneath the quilt that's on display for people to initial. I'm going to tell them, you got this much room. <laughs> we got to fit everybody in there. And then sometime after the the fall festival, I'll go back and stitch that and attach it to the back of the quilt. And so it's going to be a multi-layer, multi-process thing. I love hand lettering. And if you're interested, if anything here has sparked your curiosity and you want to know more, I'm leading a workshop this Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. I'd love to have you. Seven bucks get you in the workshop and a whole month of the nook. That includes sewing circles like happening at night, book clubs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many things. So that's me. That's what I'm working on. Today's goal is to sandwich that quilt. So I'm gonna take that quilt top and get it all sandwiched up so I can start doing all those hand ties. I'm imagining it's gonna be a pretty dense hand tying job. Like I'm, I'm envisioning the knots like, like every inch or so. So we'll see. Roderick will love that. He'll love it. Oh my God. <laughs> He's gonna love it. Dense tie quilt. Yeah. That's so beautiful. That's what I'm up that to. Spells deer. I know that's your favorite animal that you feel very connected yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. But also the other, the second row is ooh. So it's like ooh deer, which is what we just did before we started the Zoom. We saw deer. <laughs> yeah. You know, it all works out. The street for you. <laughs> that's right. It all works out. It all works out. So y'all stay tuned. See where that's going to go. That's very exciting. I vividly remember working on that collaborative quilt for the 43 for 43 and amazing to hear about a little bit of justice. Tiny a little bit. bit. A, little a huge tiny. step and a first yeah. step. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, I will share my screen. Oh, look who I'm lit with. <laughs> What? Hey. Let's see. Play from the start. And okay. Um, so I was just with Libs Quilt. I was also with um in the show at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Art was Jackie Gehring's quilt. She was our last guest. And we had um, Audrey Essery is behind me creating this lovely halo. 
and she was our first ever guest on Soft Bulk, and we talked a lot about time management, and I've been feeling that this month, so I thought that today I would do a little bit of a talk about where I'm at currently with time management and from a different angle, different point of view. Uh, here is Emily Schmilowitz. She's the curator of the show called Counting Threads. For a long time, we just called it the math show. And behind her is the work of Sarah Nishiora, who lives in Chicago, who is a fantastic quilter, um, good friend of mine. Very, very excited. I felt like I was in a room surrounded by quilts from my friends. Uh, it's probably the most quilters that I've known and loved in, in one small room at one time ever. So if you are near Wisconsin or if you can get yourself near Wisconsin, this is the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Art, 25 minutes north of my house, past some cows in a barn. And the show is really spectacular. So, so exciting to have Libs's quilt. She, you have more than one quilt in the show, but that one stood out especially. Uh, so here's some things that are going on in my world right now. Uh, I'm going to have my first ever booth at a quilt show. The Great Wisconsin Quilt Show will be in Madison in early September, the 8, 9, 10 of Madison. So I'm getting my booth together, which is a huge ball of work. I'm in particular figuring out how to use the point of sale function. Sorry, I just, I would love to be able to change my view. No, it won't let me. Yeah, you think we'd have this down by now, huh? <laughs> I know, well, it's like you can only practice it when you're, okay. Because yeah. now you guys are at the bottom. Okay, um, so I've got to, figure out how to do point of sale, buy equipment for it so that people can check out and buy things in person, which I've never done before. Um, troubleshooting a lot of issues with the apps. Um, I'm ordering postcards and supplies to give away with purchase, which is a very exciting thing. If someone buys an on-demand class from me, they're gonna get some of my favorite thread or a needle gripper or sewing needle or something else that I love. I am also filming and preparing content for Quilters Take a Moment in September. I'm going to be sharing about hand yoga and hand care and body care, how to be sustainable with your body when you're sewing. Zach is also part of Quilters Take a Moment on sustainable sewing. And I will be, um, yeah, got to get that ready. <laughs> I'm preparing my website to launch a class on diary quilts in so the class will be in January, and I've had a lot of people very generously fill out a survey about what that class might look like, what time of day works for them, what they're hoping for, and now I'm compiling it together so people can start to register soon because it will be for a limited number of people. There's a, a very live, intimate aspect of the class. I'm also applying to Quilt National. Um, Last time I couldn't apply because all of my quilts had been exhibited before and it made me frustrated that you couldn't have a quilt be exhibited. But now I have some quilts that haven't been exhibited yet. So I figure I might as well throw them in the ring. Uh, previously I've applied and been rejected and that's, that's all right. Mondo Guerrera chose that same quilt as his judge's choice quilt at QuiltCon. So <laughs> it had its moment in the sun anyways. Um, it's not often that I do quilt exhibitions that I have to pay to apply so much anymore, but I, I like that group over at Quilt National, so I'm going to try. Um, I'm preparing work to install at Real Tinsel Art Gallery this Friday. Uh, so if you're in Milwaukee, like Donna, come by. It's on the south side, Real Tinsel. I'm making my first ever video installation, so I've got to edit 18 hours of footage that I filmed while I was quilting. And uh, it's the flat files exhibit. I get to have a record of choice. They are buying everything to make my favorite cocktail, which is a yellow chartreuse spritz. So it should be a very lovely event. Um, 
I'm making the supply list for my QuiltCon classes. So there's still room in humongous curvy applique and embroidered quilts, not unlike the embroidery that I did for Zach's 43 for 43. Um, I am going to be teaching in France in 2023. I was supposed to teach there in 2020 in June, and obviously that didn't happen. So this dream is like a little egg being formed yet again, and it's we're working towards cracking it open. A lot of the details are available online now, and we are going to be opening up registration on October 1st. So all of the work happens before that moment. And I've been doing so many Zoom meetings with my friend and co-conspirator, Linda Sweek, and it's going to be amazing. It's a multi-location class in France. Um, we're going to Versailles and the Moulin Rouge and Toulouse and just, I'm like beside myself with excitement. I'm finishing three quilts for my application for the Mary Knoll Fellowship, which is due in September. I've been a finalist two years in a row. So I really feel like good that I'm on my way. Um, I sold a quilt this week on my website. So I've got to take it to the post office to get it to its new home. I've got to put sleeves on some new quilts, um, need titles for those quilts so that I can submit them to um, Quilt National. I have to, I forget what that one was. Oh, I got to meet with the Milwaukee Artist Resource Network because I'm a mentor right now. So I meet with Laura once a month. I need to pick up a quilt that was in the gift shop at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Art. I also need to support the opening of the brushed exhibition that I'm in in California, softbook, email newsletter, Instagram. So only a few things on the plate this month that I'm working on in my professional life. Personal life. So a little busy right now too. Um, but this is a photo that I took last night. This is the behind the scenes. I joined Zach for his sewing circle on the Nook recently. And while I was with him, I laid all of these bits of fabric underneath the quilt top and I've been quilting them down now. And I actually kind of like this 2 a.m. lighting that I had going on in my studio. Um, Zach, this is exciting, right? Heidi, it's incredible how those floating shapes underneath the top surface make the whole thing even more cohesive. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it really came together. And I just tossed them down on the batting and pin basted everything while I was in that sewing circle with you for an hour. And it just, um, the lack of planning really made it work. I just went with it. So it's about three quarters of the way quilted. And it's, just, it's so those, like what a surprise of a quilt it's turning out to be it's this those is what shapes are under a layer yeah it's a layer mm -hmm. of white cotton muslin unbleached so it's a thin fabric and then yeah. there's batting you can see right here there's the batting and then there's more white cotton muslin as my backing and i've appliqued a lot of shapes, uh, well, okay. some shapes on the top, but for me, this is a very embroidery heavy quilt. So it's a very special example of what I mean for my quilt con class about embroidered quilts. There's um, a rabbit on here, lots of flowers, a weeping willow tree. Um, I did a lot of sewing without looking while Zach was driving the car, taking us up to Madeline Island. But in between that quilt top, is just a lot of the little scraps that I'm storing all the time in my ball jars that we talked about when we had the zero waste chef come on. I still have more. And they they glow underneath the white cotton muslin. So that's Libs, that's what, what those shapes are. And here on the left, I'm quilting over them as though they don't exist. And now here, hugging this area, I'm quilting around them, which I don't yeah. think I've ever been so fussy with the way that I'm quilting around things before. Um, it's kind of that stitch in the ditch feeling, even though there's no ditch. It's but mm -hmm. I'm I'm tracing them. 
um, uh, even just to look at that part, it makes me think about finishing Westworld the other <laughs> the other night because that's what I was watching when I was quilting that. But this is really the I've been doing a lot of quilting lately. I also quilted my Santa Fe travel quilt that I shared about a lot here on Softbulk and. That's really what fills my cup while I'm balancing out the computer work and the other duties I've got going on. Yesterday, Danny McCullough came and photographed my quilts and I'm like giving myself permission to not photograph and edit the photos. So it just feels incredible to delegate that to a very talented professional. This is my little QR code thing that I've made for the um, booth that I'm doing at the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show so people can find everything easily. This is my, oh, I'm teaching in France, everyone. So I took lots of pretty photos to get ready to launch and celebrate that. These are some quilt sleeves that I did. And I think this top one on my diary quilt is a little bit crooked and I think I'm going to have to reattach it. I hung it up and like, it's okay, but it's not as nice as I want it to be. And even though I'm sort of devil may care in some areas, other areas I really want it to be just so. And so I think I'll be pulling out my seam ripper. Zach made an amazing reel about that a while ago. I always think of you when I think of seam rippers. <laughs> um, this is a little glimpse of my 18 hours of footage of quilting the Santa Fe travel diary quilt. I had my niece Penelope at my house for about a week and I hunkered down and snuggled with her and hand quilted. And that's the, the video that will be on display in the background or, you know, as its own piece at the real tinsel video. Her little snore, she's just... <laughs> no one sweeter than Penelope. Um, and this is my last slide. I finished my, like Danny took the photo, so I don't have a fancy photo yet, but um, from my iPhone is this photo of, I have finished quilting this quilt, which is a calendar of 2021. And it's very, very exciting for me to see that come full circle. Um, all of these little bits on the top area to me are thinking about lists and making plans and getting things done and checking stuff off. And it uh, uh, today hopefully was a window into why that's something that's often on my mind because my to-do list is a very, very essential tool. Eddie, we had a quick question from Mickey oh. wondering if your embroidery stitches on the quilt that you shared so much about that you worked on in the sew and circle, are they just the top layer or are you embroidering all the way, are you using your embroidery to quilt with? The embroidery is only on the top layer. So it does not go through the batting later. I did all the embroidery first and now just quilting. Thank you, good question. And I expanded my repertoire. Normally I'm very committed just to running stitch, back stitch, and maybe an occasional French knot or something, but I, I did some very fancy, crazy quilt inspired stitches from Zach. I can't wait till people see your, um, the little dandelion oh. that you did, the puff ball. Yep. <laughs> Incredible. I posted it on Instagram, but now I think mm. it, once I finally quilt over it, it will be even more special. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Now I know, Heidi, why I haven't been hearing from you the last few weeks. You've been busy. <laughs> I've been hibernating, quilting, <laughs> trying to ignore my email inbox. <laughs> oh, you can't, though. That's the thing. Oh, I recently <laughs> Never deleted about 30,000. I'm one of the people who have 50,000 emails yeah. in there, in, in there and, and I got rid of over half of them. So I'm down to a mere 20,000 emails. <laughs> I feel like there's so much that as we do this for a living, there's so much that people don't see, like they see the quilts, but they don't see all those to-do lists that are just like, yeah, can be really crushing. And so when I do get time, at least personally, when I do get actual time to sew, I'm like, yes, I've earned this. I know. 
I'm a professional quilter and I finally get to sew. Yeah. But all the other quilting I did this year, I feel like was just when I was sick, when I had a cold, when I had COVID, I wasn't mentally there enough to do computer work. So I got yeah. to work on a quilt. And this one, I was like, I'm going to be not sick and quilting. <laughs> And Liz, I know you're going to talk a little bit about your community and like Whip It Wednesdays and all that. That's what I've loved about the sewing circles is that it is a set apart time in which I am expected to sew. I am not yeah. checking email. I am not doing website design. I don't do it. Any, I'm just sitting there sewing. And I'm like, oh, this is what quilters are supposed to do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It is a little bit selfish of me that I'm setting up, I've set up this Whip It Wednesdays, but um, I'll, sh I'll show you why. You'll see why. I need to be, <laughs> to have like a time and a, a reason to, to get to it. So, yeah. Luke, what you cooking on over there? Oh man, well, so I've got a little slideshow to show you, but first I think I maybe will do a big screen and try to show you something in the room on the front facing camera of my laptop. It's gonna be a real joy for everyone and I'm either sorry or you're welcome. Um, let's see, make me, oh, you're making me big. Thank you. Yeah, so, I'm on top of it. Hi, did Zach, when you were showing me the, some of those quilts you made, uh, Zach, so with some of those older, there's Nicole having breakfast. Hi. Hi, Nicole. Hi. <laughs> that quilt on the wall back there is a quilt I bought at an estate sale. Um, and I posted it on Instagram, but I wanted to show you all kind of in person. Um, as you can see, it's kind of degrading in some parts of it, uh, probably because of whatever they used to uh, dye the red. But so what I did was actually re-quilted the entire thing, adding more batting and uh, a whole brand new back to it. But I just thought that that was such a, a fun piece that with Zach showing you some of the work he did on some of those other quilts, I thought maybe it'd be fun to show. And you can see kind of that this entire corner lost its color over time. Kind of fun. It's and why, any idea why that might have happened, Luke? Do you have a theory? I don't know why the color would have been lost. I know that a lot of uh, reds were, were made with iron oxide. And so then the degrading certainly makes sense kind of down here in the corner. Oh. What's uh, happening? We're viewing Linda Brock's That's screen. Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Let's see, how do we, have... Linda, are you able to stop screen sharing? Uh, yes, I will. Oh, God, I got this it. could have been <laughs> gone so much worse. No, <laughs> oh, I would love to see what's on your computer screen. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> it's way better to accidentally screen share than accidentally camera share sometimes, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, Zach, I have no idea why the, the color would have degraded. I know fabric degrades because of the dye, but the fact that just that whole section is just kind of gone there. Oh, we're to do a little spin. Um, I have no idea why that would have happened. And I think it's so dynamic. It makes, yeah, I love it, I love it. It makes me think that that red must have been a different fabric altogether, a different. Yeah, because there's actually a couple down in the corner, <laughs> just like a couple of the pieces still there. Yeah. Or just gives you that so ghost much. star. Yeah, yeah, I loved it so much that I wanted to repair it. Um, and sort of have a collaboration with it rather than try to recontextualize it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now I'm going to pivot over and I'll show you what I have prepared. Okay, so um, this is this is kind of uh, seemingly kind of what's going on um, right now. I just got back from Auburn University where I had a show of quilts and it was really fun because um, well, a lot of reasons. One, Auburn is a university that I have loved for a very long time. They have an amazing architecture department. And I thought about going there uh, for sort of some second, second school, um, but didn't end up doing that because I became a professional quilter. <laughs> uh, but so it's cool to have a show there and fun to have another show again. I mean, since pandemic, uh, prior to pandemic, I was probably having, I don't know, 10 to 15 shows a year. And since then I've had four shows in total. Uh, several of which I made myself. So <laughs> it's fun to get some stuff back up on the wall. Um, 
And so I just wanted to show you a little bit of that. Starting, of course, with the way that they flyered the entirety of the, the art building, which I thought was very funny and very silly. So Nicole and I have a lot of pictures of those flyers and almost less pictures of the work. <laughs> That's just the way of it. Um, I will say to everyone, because I made the mistake, make sure you document everything. Um, if pictures are free. Um, forgetting to do it can be expensive. But anyway, so this is... Uh, uh, some pictures of the show um, in the space. And I've got a little fun video we'll go through um, to just kind of, to show some quilts. It was, they asked me to do a, um, because it's in the gallery at the university and they were having all the kind of prospective students do it because it's been there for, I don't know, three months or so. So all the prospective students came through. So they wanted to have a lot of different ways to show quilts. Um, and different parts of kind of series that I've made. And the uh, Dean of the department came up and told me that she's actually had to order a lot of sewing machines. They don't have a fiber department, but people from multiple different departments have demanded and requested sewing machines uh, after this show, which I, I feel very good about <laughs> uh, that people are getting into sewing. Um, there's me. Oh. Oh, oh, okay, I'll show you the video of it. I think that shows it a little bit better. Um, those pictures were because Nicole is very funny. <laughs> so I called it beauty and function because, you know, quilts get to sort of exist in this duality of um, utility kind of meets aesthetic you know and we we all get to kind of choose where the edges of those are right do we use them are they bed size are they tiny are they wall size are they painted is there batting is there backing are they quilted and how heavily is it quilted can you wash them what's the material is it durable all those kind of questions go into our practices so um, i think that that's important as we think about um quilts sort of that beauty and function thing this is the a little close up of a collaboration with Joe Cunningham. I think I showed I showed y'all some pictures of these pieces um, before when we had Joe. Here's some of the balloon series. I think I've talked about the balloon series. Um, kind of a, a reference to the the capital A art, sort of Gagosian, Jeff Koons, what is the value of an object? And then these are some of the anamorphic quilts that I made, this one's Obama. So if you pop around the side, it looks like he's standing up. And then when you view it from uh, the front, it kind of looks like he's very skewed and it's just kind of um, allows the quilt to exist as a sculptural object to sort of force you to walk around it rather than just viewing it as kind of a, a wall painting. And that's not a bad thing at all to, to kind of treat a quilt as a painting, but um, I think there's you know a, a range of ways to have conversations with quilts, so that's part of it. I, uh, so I wasn't there for the install. I sent a bunch of quilts and I told the install to put a pedestal and flop some quilts on it. And they were very nervous about that part of the installation. Everything else went fine, except for, can you just flop some quilts on a pedestal somewhere in the room? Thanks. <laughs> You're letting them be the artist for a minute. Yeah, and they didn't like it. <laughs> Well, if they're listening, I think they did a great job. I loved it. I think they did a great job too. So that is, let's see, do I have any more photos of that? Not really. Um, let me pop back to, um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's the one where they, they flopped it on top of the pedestal and we're like, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, you can't do it wrong. That's the, that's the fun part about some, you know, that's the fun part about, uh, uh, soft bulk, right? You can't, you can't, I mean, you know, I, I say often that part of the reason that I'm able to be a professional artist is that I use quilts because I could ship this entire show and it cost me, you know, maybe a couple hundred dollars in total because I insured it, right? Uh, but if I was a painter and I was sending a single eight foot painting, it would have cost thousands of dollars. Um, 
you know, much less the cost of the crate. So I really think that we are, we have a secret <laughs> benefit to being quilters, you know, definitely sort of a nod to soft bulk, shove it in a box and ship it across the country. In fact, uh, as a funny clip, shoving it in a box is actually better for the longevity of a quilt than folding it in half. So if you fold it in half every time, you're gonna get a crease right down the middle. But if you just wad it in a box, step on it and shove it in there, you're actually not going to ever wad it the same way twice. So you won't degrade the fabric in one part, uh, which I think is actually very fun. Although I will say um, that doesn't look good if you're sending it to someone who's bought the quilt <laughs> or if, you know, some major curator that you want to impress. Uh, don't just wad it into a box and you know duct tape it down. Um, <laughs> not that Luke, I kind of... I kind of want you to do a show where you mail all your quilts, quilts to the gallery and they just turn the box upside down, dump the quilt out, and it just lays on the floor as is, however it comes out of the box. And so you just have all these piles of quilts around. It's very, it's very Kanye West. I don't know if you know, he just did a big drop with um, Gap. Kanye West and Gap did a big uh, collaboration and Kanye's, they just brought him in in these massive, you know, those dumpster bags. It's like a... I don't know, call it like a five foot by five foot cube um, full of hoodies. And they just like forklift them in the middle of the gap and left it there. And so if you wanted your size, you had to dig for it. If you, if you wanted to know what was in there, you just had to dig for it. So these massive crowds just digging through these uh, bags of um, $100 sweatshirts. And it's just such a, a funny conversation about the object and, you know, fashion and whatever. But I like that. Makes me, you know, I, you know, like Kanye. That's why I'm having, you know. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, we did have a couple. Uh, yeah, go on. Go, go ahead, Luke. We had some questions. Oh, good. Well, I would love, a, I would love some questions, and that's that's really what I wanted to show today. I just wanted to kind of show you some of the the quilts on walls and um, show you kind of that I'm just having a good time having a show again, and that it was real fun to to visit the university. It looks great. And I got to see some of your work recently in Asheville too, which we haven't even talked about, but maybe people have seen it on Instagram, but that was a treat to see your work for the first time in person live. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Zach was amazing and went and took some photographs of a piece that I have up at the Asheville Art Museum, uh, which was super fun. That's where I grew up. So it's fun to have some, some work there. I wasn't able to make it, unfortunately. Nicole and I were on the way and then got COVID. So we had to pivot our trip and go home and feel sorry for ourselves for a couple of weeks. So Zach went and took some pictures, which was awesome. It was fun talking to the person at the desk. I'm like, I have a funny question. <laughs> I don't really want to see the whole museum. I just need to see my friend Luke's quilt. Can I just take a picture? And she's like, here's your sticker. And I was oh, like, yes. that's so nice. Yes. Yeah. Um, they're so yeah. kind. That's such a great museum. Yeah, oh, it was a wonderful museum. So one of the questions that came up was from Judah who wonders just on average, if you had to put in a time to the quilts that you make, how long would you say it takes you? You were in the middle of talking about your anamorphic quilts, but she said any quilts, Judah said any quilts would work. Yeah, a great question. Um, so, and it's a question that comes up a lot. So you'd think I'd have like a, a zippy answer off the top, but the answer is uh, somewhere between 30 hours and a thousand hours. And it really depends on the detailing. Libs knows about that. Like how small are those pieces gonna get? Like, do you wanna do that work or, you know? So if I make a quilt out of um, bed sheets and I'm just trying to churn it out, I could probably do it in, you know, a heavy three days um, versus something else that's taken me five months to make because I'm designing the method, uh, learning the patterning um, and heavily quilting it to prove to quilters that they should give me attention because I've done a lot of work so that they're willing to look at it. Um, there's, there's a lot more time that kind of goes into that. So, you know, again, the, the, the answer is between 30 and a thousand <laughs> and uh, truly it depends on, um, the messaging, you know, and like, and, and I don't mean that as like one side is better than the other. Like, I think what's really important about the time is, uh, the time shows up. If I make something really fast, it looks like it's fast. Uh, if I make something that takes for cuss word, cuss word ever, it looks like, or it should look like that it took that long. And I think there's some really important distinctions in the object if it looks like it took a long time. People trust you in different ways than if it looks like it was fast. And so I think that there's um, value to understanding your intention for the viewer to receive the work 
as it relates to the amount of time you're willing to put into it, right? Like Heidi's doing all of this hand stitching, which allows someone to come up close and say, oh gosh, that was done with a girl with a needle on a couch with a dog. Let me think <laughs> about that differently than if it was just, you know, um, I programmed or, or something like that. So, you know, I think the answer is, is like, you know, a wide range, but the more important answer is um, the intention of the time actually sort of sets the stage for how much it's gonna, how long it's gonna take you, I think. So I'm answering a question you didn't ask, <laughs> uh, but thanks for the question. Awesome. Right. Well, awesome. Yeah, everyone. And of course, if there's any other questions, feel free, shoot them in the chat, send me whatever. Um, but last and by no means least, Libs Elliot, the one and only VIP. Woohoo! Hey, friends. Hi. Um. Okay. My gosh. I'm gonna share my screen. How about that? Boy, we all learned how to use Zoom, didn't we? In the last two years. You'd sure think did. we all learned how to use Zoom, but I, I bet every third time I do something wrong. <laughs> I tried to do breakout rooms once and I think I kicked everyone out of the class. I don't know. So I'm still, yeah, I know what I need to know. <laughs> um, you know, okay. So I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot in the last little while about communities that I've been part of and that I am part of. And so I put together some slides just to talk about the different communities that I've been involved in. And so I'll be showing some of my work. I'm not, I'm not gonna get heavy into detail about my process, um, but if you do have questions about my process, you know, throw them in the chat, I'm happy to answer. Um, and I can always do a little code demo if you, if you want me to at the end, because I don't know how many of you know my work and how many don't. But, but I've really been thinking a lot about creative communities and collaboration and how that really does help with growth, at least for me. <laughs> or AKA how it's no fun to work in a silo. And I'll show you how I know that. <clears throat> and I've been writing down some of these ideas. Um, so I seeking out communities that encourage collaboration, but also creative autonomy. So I love to be part of, um, part of groups, but I still like to be myself and unique. And I think we're all like that when we, as quilters, we all bring our own creativity to the table, which is something special. Um, and I, I think this is the same thing, just written differently. Um, I like to break the rules and be my own person, but also thrive in a group with common interests. Same thing. Um, good community and collaboration can bring out the best. Um, it can set you forward. It can open up new ideas and new directions. And I love this idea that communities are microcosms of bigger universes. So lean into it. So, and I'll get into that a little bit about just our, our, you know, we've got this huge quilting community, but then there are all these little micro communities within that. <clears throat> and the first time I really experienced this and really felt like I was part of something special was back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, when I was really into punk rock <laughs> and DIY, and DIY is, stands for do it yourself. And so I grew up in this, Hold on, I'm just gonna make our make this small. Whoop, no, um, I can't make this smaller here. It's okay. I grew up in a small town outside of Toronto and I have a younger sister who's two years younger than me. And it was kind of, it was a boring town. You know, my, uh, my dad owned an antique shop which was attached to our house. And so my first experience with quilts was seeing them at auction barns. We go to the auction every Friday so he could bid on uh, furniture and quilts. He would buy quilts for collectors. And so walking into those auction barns and seeing the quilts hanging on the walls were, as a young child, were really like, I was really drawn to them. Um, and, you know, and then going into his shop and into his workshop, which was in the basement where he fixed furniture, um, I really got to appreciate firsthand uh, handmade goods, 
right? I was allowed to touch everything. My parents did not tell us not to touch anything. Our home is full of antiques and beautiful, precious things and textiles and quilts, but they all got used. Like there's a quilt from the 1800s and it would get put under the Christmas tree at Christmas time or it would get, you know, be on the table at the dining table for a big event. So, you know, we were, we were allowed to use them as functional objects. Um, and I learned to really appreciate craftsmanship that way. But other than that, <laughs> there wasn't a lot going, in my home, going on in my hometown. Um, so my sister and I decided, you know, there is nothing for us to do. Let's make something for us to do. Uh, and we had a group of friends who were really into music and all were, everyone was in bands and things. So we would put on shows. We would like rent out the boys and girls club hall and we would um, get a PA system and friends from other towns would come and they'd play and all the kids would come to the show. We'd charge maybe a dollar or two dollars so that we'd give the bands gas money so they could get home in their parents' vans. Um, <laughs> and it was just this fun little scene that we started to create. And then eventually my sister and I put together uh, a zine. Oh my gosh, so the zines, I still have them from 30 years ago. <laughs> which is so cute. I found them last night in a box and they're all like cut and pasted. We typed on a typewriter and then pasted them onto the paper. And then hopefully if you're lucky, you've got a friend at the local Kinko's and they can make copies for you. And then you can see this one was like, we hand tied the binding on it. We made a little stamp for it. Pretty cute. And then inside it was just like, do you want to join, you know, want to do something for the zine? Just send us an article, write a review of an album, whatever. So we started to put these little zines out and it was a great way to reach out to other tiny little scenes and communities who were all into the same music uh, and had pretty much the same values. So I don't know, it was this first, first time where you really felt connected to something bigger outside of just your small town. You knew that it was going on in other towns too, not only in Canada, but like across North America and in Europe. So it was kind of, it was pretty fun. And the crazy thing was there was no internet back then, way back in the day. So, so if you wanted to connect with someone, like you wrote a letter, you put your $1 in an envelope and you sent it off and hopefully they would send you a zine or a seven inch album or tape, whatever. Um, and so that's how you communicated with one another. It's really, uh, <laughs> it was really uh, lo-fi, but fun. And even like this shot maker album here, this is a little seven inch album by my brother-in-law's band. So my sister ended up marrying this guy and <laughs> he's my brother for like the last 30 years. But we had to like glue and paste the album covers together ourselves and sit there and, and make these covers and, and do everything by hand. So it was a very hands-on, definitely do-it-yourself community to be part of. Um, we would have potluck dinners. We would go dumpster diving at the local grocery store for, you know, perfectly good vegetables and fruits and do all kinds of fun stuff like that. So that was really, and that happened when I was, you know, between the ages of 16 and 20, that was when I really felt this great sense of community that I was part of something big and important. And then we all grew up and we all had to get jobs. Um, and, you know, I went to art school and I studied weaving and natural dyeing and photography and cultural studies and women's studies. Uh, and I got a job in advertising and it was boring. I worked with all kinds of really creative, wonderful people, but I was a project manager. I was making those to-do lists for everybody. Um, so I got to be around creative people, but I didn't have a creative outlet. So I started quilting um, and I took a couple classes at a local fabric shop and I was quilting fairly traditional looking quilts. And it was nice, it was fine, but it didn't really feel like me. Um, so then I reached out to a friend named Joshua Davis. And Josh I'd met through another community that my husband was part of, which is like a sort of web developer, creative, uh, digital creative groups. Um, and Josh has been doing digital artwork probably for close to 30 years. So he's one of the first people to um, really take a program called Flash and do really creative computer generated work 
using Flash, and then eventually he switched over to using a program called Processing. So I said to Josh, you know, it would be amazing if we could collaborate um, and you could help me design, figure out a way to design quilts that have a little more meaning to me. And he said, yes, which was fantastic. So then I was sort of diving into this whole other, this whole other community of, you know, people who are coders and generative artists and experimenting um, with, with making generative artwork. So the this is the very first generative quilt that I made in 2012. And so this one, I really feel like this changed my entire uh, creative perspective. It changed my whole trajectory. Um, I hadn't planned to make quilting, you know, my career, um, but this really set me on a whole new path. Uh, what I loved about it was that I was breaking the rules with this quilt, but still paying tribute to tra traditional quilts by using, you know, really traditional, very simple geometry and blocks, but mixing them up and blowing them up. And I'd never seen anything like this before at the time um, in the quilting world that I was aware of, but it really made me feel like this is it. This is me. This is this combines that sort of love of antiques and old things and tradition and just pushes it forward into this whole new realm, this sort of that sort of rebellious gotta be different libs and that's that really embodies um, it for me in this quilt. So then I continued on making these quilts, but I was very much working in a silo. So I'm just gonna flip through these, there's a lot of them. But over the years for, you know, until about 2016, 20, no, 2014, so for the first two years, I was just making these, selling them as commissions to mostly programmers or young, mostly guys who are into programming and, and computer code. Um, or data visualization specialists, people who worked with code who saw that I was doing something creative and physical with it. But I wasn't really aware that there's this whole quilting community of people out there. I didn't know there were guilds. I never, it just wasn't a thing that I was aware of. Um, so I was just working on these, you know, making commissions, still working as a project manager and doing this um, and each one, I love, each one is unique. So I never make the same quilt twice when I'm using um, processing. So the render that comes out of the computer, I've set parameters, right? I've set some rules, I've set colors and general shapes, but then I never know what's gonna pop up on the screen. And so when I do get a render that I like, then I make it into an actual physical quilt. So it's like this one unique moment in time set of algorithms and pixels and then I actually make it into something physical and so each one is unique. I got a lot of green ones though you do one green one and then someone else says oh I liked that green one can you make me a green one or a pink one so so there's some repetitive uh things happening with the palettes but I like to keep simple palettes so just the the shapes shine and keep this the quilting fairly simple straight line I used to baste a lot of them on the floor. I still do sometimes, it hurts more now, <laughs> um, but I try. And so what I discovered that was really cool about that coding community that I'm still, I still sort of, um, I'm involved in a little bit or like I follow along on Twitter mostly because a lot of these generative artists are now selling their work as NFTs. They actually have a way to start making money for their work. Um, but these, this coding community is a really fantastic group because they share their code. Um, a lot of it is open source. They share how they're building things. So someone else will take it, put their own spin on it um, and make it theirs, which is very much like the quilting community, right? We have we have certain sets of rules or shapes or techniques we use, and then we each take those, we learn about them, and then we, um, we make them our own. So that was what, that's what I find really cool about the coding community. And I recently did a talk with them, and I think what's neat is that they hadn't thought about quilts at all or about our community. And so when you bring that to light, they're like, oh my gosh, look at all this geometry. This is so cool. Like we could take cues from their work and put it into ours. 
And so it's that really neat sort of cross pollination of creativity and ideas that happens. And so a lot of these quilts I don't own anymore. I sold them as commissions or I did um, various design shows or exhibitions and I've sold a lot of them off into the world, which I love. I like, I mean, it's always a little bit hard letting go, but um, I do love sending quilts off on their own journeys. I never know where they're gonna end up. And so that's kind of exciting to me. So, Finally, I became aware of the quilting community. In 2014, I put out my first quilt pattern. And this is the Rebel Quilt. So the Rebel Quilt is a generative quilt. But what I love about this is not only the design is generative, but what I love is that I can take this design or this pattern, I can send it out to anyone who wants to purchase it. Someone else will take it, put their own fabrics into it, maybe a quilter, long armor, long arms, their own design on top. And it's like these little virtual collaborations happening where I'm giving you a piece of me and then you're putting yourself in and maybe you have a quilter or like long armor, put their self in. And the same thing happens when I design fabric, you know, I'll send off my fabrics and I love seeing how people use those in their work. So that's what's been really cool about finally discovering the quilt community. And this was in 2014. So since then for the last like eight years, is it eight years? Yeah. You know, traveling around the world to teach um, and learn a lot from other quilters, putting out fabric, putting out quilt or yeah, quilt patterns. Um, it's like this constant exchange of creativity and knowledge. And I just love it. But I had no idea, you know, before 2014 that it existed. Um, so, you know, I just, it's this huge group. And I think it's really also very helpful that we have the internet to do this, right? Because we couldn't have done this back in 1989 in a zine. Although I hear zines are cool again, Zach, Heidi. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was sort of my introduction to the quilt community was finally putting a pattern out and seeing what would happen. And then one of the other things I started to do was um, create some a generated, a community generated quilt. So I love that the, you know, random element for these becomes people rather than a computer. It's the people inputting their own piece into a larger quilt. And then that becomes the, you know, the generative aspect of the quilt. So in 2015, Don Mass, who's a teacher in San Diego at a fine arts academy, an elementary school, that's fine arts. Like I would have died and gone to heaven if I had this school around me. Um, but he put together a whole blog post about my work. And then he created a whole tutorial for art teachers, any art teachers around the world who wanted to do this. Um, he created this whole tutorial on how to make paper quilts with classes. So it's accessible to little kids, like kindergarten, right up through grade eight. And they made this really beautiful paper quilt. And he shared that on his blog. He shared that with a lot of teachers all over the place. And um, since then, I've had, I don't, I don't know how many teachers reach out from all over sending photos or tagging me to show me these beautiful paper quilts that their schools have made. Um, so these are just based on, you know, you keep one element sort of the same, which is the background color. You keep the background color in rainbow order, but the top pieces are a little more randomized. So I decided to do one <clears throat> with fabric in New York for New York Design Week um, in 2015 or 2016. And um, for a whole week, I had people coming up to a table who could, I had pre-cut squares. They would peel off the, um, the back of the triangles because I used fusible web and they could stick the triangles down wherever they wanted on their square. And then I would take the squares back to my hotel room every night and sew them all together and bring them back. And so what I loved was really cool because it was design week. So you would have like, uh, you know, interior designer come up and be very, or an architect, be very intentional about where they place their shapes. And you'd have a two-year-old come up and just slap the shapes down 
And then you put them all together and it looks like this and it all looks amazing together. You know, it's this whole community came together to create this really cool wild piece. And then finally, so finally I had this quilted last year um, and I still need to bind it, but uh, it's got two layers of nice fluffy wool batting in it and um, eye candy quilts quilted it for me. And oh my gosh, she was amazing. She went around every single shape to tack it down. So I know it was a lot of work, but it just looks really fantastic. And it was the first really great um, community quilt that, I, that I'd done. And then I also did one for um, a grade five class at my kids' school who were graduating. So we left that for the school where they signed their names all along the side. And then he's, there's some other paper quilts that teachers have sent me. So this one was all red, white, and blue, which I think was really uh, interesting and beautiful. And this one looks, you know, it's on point. It looks like very much like snowflakes. And this one, I think was just posted this earlier this week. She tagged me in this. They've already done this. I think they had their first week of school. Um, I can't remember where in the States, but I just love, uh, that teachers, you know, pull kids together into a community, an entire school community project like this so that even the smallest kids feel like they're part of something and it encourages creativity and it gets them, um, gets them motivated to be part of something big, right? And I always feel with something like quilting, uh, if you want kids to get into it or you want younger people to get into it, then make it relevant to them. So do use technology <laughs> as much as you can teach them. They'll probably pick up the iPad and know more than you do, but that's how you get them hooked is make it relevant to them, to how their minds work right now and the tools that they like to use and they will get, they will be interested. <clears throat> and then finally, I've got this Patreon community that I've been building for a few years and is slowly getting bigger, which is great. But this is why I've been thinking a lot about community recently, because, you know, for the last few years, I was treating it sort of like a blog. So it is a membership based community. You pay a monthly fee and, you know, I share blog posts or sneak peeks about fabric I'm designing or, you know, uh, a quilt I might be, a pattern I might be making. But I want to make it more of an exchange, like rather than me just putting stuff out there. Um, I want to make it even more interactive. So we've been doing these samplers for the last two years. The fun thing about these samplers is that every month I do put out the pattern and a video to go with it, but I'll share some of the, you know, I'll be, I'm making it at the same time as everyone else. So I haven't made these quilts in advance. I'm working along with everybody else in the community. I'm sharing some of my frustration over some of those curves in that 2021 one. There were some challenging little strips and things that weren't lining up. And I would share like, okay, this is the challenge I've come up against. Here's how I fixed it. What did you do? And so it became this little like, have you tried this method to put these, applique these circles on? And so it was a really nice, it felt, it feels like we're sharing our knowledge more, more than just me putting stuff out there. And so that's why I'm starting this Whip It Wednesdays, which starts on the 31st. And I'm just going on for an hour every other Wednesday. It might um, end up being every Wednesday. And this will be my excuse to sew because if I have to get on a Zoom with everybody else, I have to sew something or I have to at least show you where I'm at with a project. And I don't like using the whole like account, like being held account accountable for your work that's not fun. It's not, it sounds like you're in a court or something. I just, I want to show you what I'm doing and encourage you to move along with your projects too. So that's what I'm hoping to do with this Whip It Wednesdays. I think it'll be pretty, um, it'll be pretty fun. And I'm going to show you the first project that I will be talking about during the first Whip It Wednesday, because this is my reason for setting this up. So at some point last year, Josh said to me, Libs, you've made a lot of triangle quilts. I think we should do a new collab. I was like, okay, what do you got? 
And Josh is like, I've got this code that I run. It's animated. It, I pull out screenshots and it's based on cellular automaton. And I'm not gonna give you the definition of that. You should probably look it up, um, but it's based on very mathy, science-based. And some of the results look like this. Very cool. And he sent me a thousand renders. And this is the downside between the digital and the physical is that the digital, here, there's a thousand. And, and the physical is me spending a year making one of these, right? So this is the design we chose. And I've been, I broke it down in Illustrator full scale to try and figure out how to make this. It's been this huge learning curve of just problem solving. The center section was all tiny strips sort of put together, um, offset from each other. I was very nervous about having to cut it down to size, but I did that. Um, and then I took a big break from it. Like a lot of things happened last year and I just wasn't feeling it. And then there was a point where I was like, if I, when I look at this quilt, it makes me cry. <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, if you're looking at a project and you weep or you're feeling like you feel like crying, it is okay to take a break from that project. <laughs> okay. You don't want to put all that negative. I very much believe in the energy that you put into your quilts. And if you've got a whole lot of negative energy or grief, and this is quilt is not meant to be a quilt that, to hold grief, then step away. It's okay. Put that grief into another <laughs> you know, grief focused quilt or something. Um, in any case, there's a lot of tiny piecing and I'm so close to being finished. So that's why I'm doing this Whip It Wednesdays because I wanna show everyone where I'm at and then be held accountable. I honestly, I think I have four sections of these left to go, some bigger sections, but that's it. See down there, just that one little chunk. Like, come on, Libs, you can do it. So I know if I share that with my Patreon community, I'll get a little bit of motivation and encouragement to get it done. And then hopefully other people will share some of their whips that they've got in their pile, because I know you've all got whips. And, um, and I can encourage you to do it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my Patreon community and where it's, where it's sort of headed. I'm always trying to think of new ideas and how to grow it and how to, how to make it more of a community than just a blog page or a website. So I'm always thinking of new ways to create that. Um, but that's sort of, that's it for my slides. But this is sort of what I feel. It's like, I've got this little Patreon community. Zach has his Nook community. You know, we've, you've got softball and then they overlap. And it's really, it's so cool to be able to jump in and out of these little communities within this much bigger creative entity that we've got going. Um, and that's what I love about what we have going in quilting. We can all leave our little, leave our mark by setting up these communities and, and sharing our knowledge and our creativity. And that's it. I love it, Liz. Yeah. yeah. You know, on the note of community, I just, I, I feel like one of the lessons I'm learning and relearning in life is that the quilting community is very large. Like the quilt tent is a very big tent. There's room for everybody. And every quilter has a slightly different approach to how they do things, right? So mm -hmm. there are folks out there, I mean, I've been watching the chat that are enamored of your programming approach and bringing something digital into something textile. And those are folks that are maybe already part of your community or maybe going to be new to your community. It'll be, it'll be fun to see. Yeah. Yeah, I do love that. Like what you like what you just said, there is room for everyone. And mm -hmm. I, I really believe that. And even as uh, a business, there's room for everyone. And I've found so far that I've never been told by another person who does this for a living, no, I can't share that with you. Or no, I can't help you out. It's always, yes, I can help. Yes, you know, here's, here's what you need to do or how can I help you? So it's always been this really great, encouraging community. Um, and I always like to try and push that as much as possible and make my groups as inclusive as possible. Um, it's just that punk rock, <laughs> the punk rock values that I have. I used to show up at shows and it was all, you know, a lot of straight white boys. 
but then there's like a couple queer kids and the girls and you know you just got to own your space and stay in there and I feel the same way about quilting community like get everyone in here that's what makes it fun and important yeah I still wanted to talk about that. She she chimed in, and I think this is so important. Chris said, because we're all creators in this tent, we just keep making the tent bigger. Yeah. And that's so true. It's, it's we, like, we it's know exponential. how to sew, sew a bigger tent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Diane wanted me to share my vodka bottle. Yeah, I took those slides out. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard keeping it down to time. <laughs> it is, yeah. Do we have time for a little coding demo? Yeah, I would love to see that. Yeah, you want to see one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Share screen. I'll show you. Let me make this smaller. Like, no, wait. Okay. All right. Somewhere down here. So, Ignore that it's okay. It's called triangle sex just because Josh said, Oh, it's like triangles having sex when you do this code. And he's That's not amazing. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. shape, shape's getting funky. I'm like, Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. This is the latest one I've been playing with. So it's got this color palette that I've been calling like acid, raspberry, lemonade is death something <laughs> but what it does sorry it does doesn't look very fun it's not a program you know it's a, it's coding language um you can set up i set up a grid so right now my grid is 800 by 800 and i input colors so I've got a background color set up here. I'm not sure what the color is. It, I think it's the acid lime. And then I set up, put in color palettes. So I've got an entire color palette here that are all hex values. These other ones are all turned off. There are other color palettes I've used before. Um, so I've got my colors, I've got my grid size, and then I can also choose my shapes. So I've drawn different quilt blocks uh, as SVGs, as vector graphics, they sit in another folder and I call them into the code by turning them on. So right now I've just got a square and an hourglass. We'll keep it simple for this one and see what happens. So I've just got two different shapes and I've got them rotating four ways at 90 degrees. And oh, I've got them, let's turn this off for a minute. We'll turn off the scaling. So the scale, they're all gonna land, I think, at the same, same size. And then I just run this and it should pop up. Yeah, Ooh. so it just pops up this random, right? It's taken my parameters, but it's randomly um, placing them on the grid. Do a second one, just to give a comparison. Yeah, so I'll do it again. I closed it, I'm never getting that one again. Do it again, similar but different. Never the same one twice. I can play with, this is the way I've been doing, this one I, oh, it's cool. You change the um, scale and they start to overlap each other and push uh -huh. each other out of the way. And those are the ones that I really was initially drawn to back in 2012 and the ones that I still really love where you get these alternate shapes and, and negative space and really cool things happening. So then for the most part, Liz, when you take that into textile, you're doing piecing with some applique. Is that right? All piecing. All piecing. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so far it's just all been, <laughs> it's all been piecing. Um, this one, the piece that I showed at the end there has like one little strip in it that I've appliqued. Other than that, it's all pieced. So it is always this like, okay, what scale am I going to work at? like what block size and then what what's the math around all of it so it can get kind of uh it can get pretty complicated let me see if i got another one here 
Linz, have you uh, ever dabbled in um, tangential crafts like um, input this to jacquard or hack a knitting machine or um, something like that? I mean, certainly you could weave it, but that becomes really difficult. But there are machines that, like like a jacquard. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could fit like this far into it. You know, have you done any? Have you have you dabbled? I haven't dabbled. There is another woman that I know of. I think her name is Victoria Pollock. Pa Lick, and um, she does creates generative work and then uh, weaves it on a jacquard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so weaving is definitely another like, ooh, it would be fun to get back into that. I did get a free loom last year and it's been sitting in my studio for the last eight months and I've given myself a year to use it, so. But it's not well, a jacquard, it's just a floor loom. But well, I'm talking about send the file to a company who prints it out for you. Else. On a oh, I have. Yeah, I actually have. There was one place called Wovens, W-O-V-N-S. And Wovens can do um, custom weaving uh, if you send them a file. And I remember I supported their Kickstarter. And so I got a yard of fabric. So I'd sent them one that was that looked like, um, that was all hexagons and it was really pretty and they did a really nice job. And it comes out like a fairly heavy um, upholstery fabric. Sure. Yeah. Let me think if I can find the pretty, it's one called like pretty something, something, absolute vodka bottle. What's this one? Yeah, so those are the shapes I used for the vodka bottle back in 20, what was it, 16 or something? Canada's 150th. Canada's 150th. We've, this land has been around a lot longer. I've learned a lot since then. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, there's one that's hexagons. Sunrays. The sunray one is cool. Sorry, I hope I'm not boring people. Not no, this is so interesting. You are not boring. But it's awesome to see how like kind of boring the code looks and then it makes something so amazing. And then, yeah, this wow. pops out and then you think, I might use this. So you save it in a folder. And now I've got like thousands of saved <laughs> renders, but I still reference them or I'll still go back and pull something that I might have done back in 2015 and say, okay, now it's time. Now I'm going to make this quilt. Um, because I, I do have so many different ideas that if it's, if I still like it five years from now, then chances are I will try to make it. Um, I would just love to have more time, more time for actual selling, so. Uh, Liz, I have a, a potentially sort of, um, I don't know, uh, esoteric question. And that is, as you're sort of um, creating community objects, uh, you know, so for example, you know, if you, if if you make a, a system and a school makes it, like they keep the object. If you make an object and then you sell a pattern, like you keep yours, they keep theirs. But if you're mm -hmm. making something kind of like, as you make something with a community, you know, there's an interesting conversation about sort of like ownership, right? You I mean, if it's it. like, if you bring the method, the materials, the skill set, like it's yours, you know, you're having people invest their time to your object, but there's this kind of like, at a certain point, if it's 50 50, or you just come in and you say, I've only brought scissors, you guys bring fabric and we'll design it together. Like who owns it? You know, there's such a, yeah. I don't know. I don't really know how to ask the question, that's but just a, kind of the ownership of object. Go ahead. That's a good, I'm going to turn my, off my sharing. That's a really good question. And I was thinking of it like yesterday, because I was thinking, you know, what hasn't been done at like, say, QuiltCon or, you know, for any of us doing a retreat together or whatever is making a quilt where we're, we're all just contributing to the same piece. And I, I was like, oh, maybe that would be a cool quilt con class where everyone, you know, adds a piece to the quilt. But then, yeah, but then whose is it? Or does it become a quilt that you then like auction off for charity? Um, because, yeah, who, who owns it if it's your methodology, but someone else is doing the work? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It is a really I mean, good... I 
Yeah, I have I have a piece in my studio still that I did in a class in France where we all I taught the students how to sort of we did like round robins, we switched it and then I like we put it all together, cut it up and put it back together. So it's like more interesting and in aggregate, but like who owns the object? You know, I didn't do any of the sewing, but I did all of the teaching and methods and materials, etc. So like now I'm I I have it and I can do the quilting, but like what to do with it afterwards? Like I can't sell yeah. it in a traditional way. Uh, yes, yeah, interesting, interesting conversations as you sort of overlap into community. Yeah, and that's what that unity quilt that I have, the big rainbow one from New York, like, what am I going to do with it? It's sitting here, I could, I could show it, maybe if someone wanted to show it, that would be great. Um, but yeah, do I sell it at some point? And is that okay? And do I feel okay with that when it was like this really nice community thing that happened? So I'm not sure, maybe it does become... Yeah, someone just said, Trav said, acknowledge community contribution. So yeah, maybe. Although, I, I mean, in that, in that case, you brought the materials, the method, the know-how, and yeah. to do it. So like, I think you're, you're at 51% at least. So in my mind, there's sort of an ownership there. And, uh, you know, ownership is definitely a gray area and people have very strong opinions about it. Um, a la the don't use old quilts for um jackets thing and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's there's strong opinions and every and they're valid like not to not to, to sort of cast disparaging no. remarks on people's strong opinions it's just an, an interesting yeah, thing you know if you buy a quilt with no name on it at a yard sale for two bucks like is it yours what do you do with it yeah and i think we'll always have those issues that we never that we can't all agree on but that's what makes it interesting too yeah. right or <laughs> controversial <laughs> interesting good point everyone brings up really good points I have to say that initially I was how do I say this the whole cutting up quilts I was because my dad was an antique dealer and everything to me is precious and has history and blah, blah. so seeing quilts get cut up I was initially like no and then as I started to read people's I'm like oh yeah shoot like there's a lot of we got a lot of stuff out there like and we're still yeah it's like I'm cool I'm cool with it I, I don't know if I'll do it but I'm cool with seeing it done especially when you're honoring that original maker and making something else beautiful and continuing it on I don't know I'm like cut up my quilts when I'm dead I'm dead I don't know like <laughs> Hopefully my quilts outlast me for a while, at least. Little records ah. of libs. So, like, I like the idea of that your quilts are records of you and your energy and play, time and place. And I've done that with my body too, with my tattoos that might be unsettling to some, but um, <laughs> I've done that with my body too. I've collected all these little pieces, but you know, they're gonna go with me. So at least my quilts will still be out in the world. So yeah. I don't know who else. Has yeah, it's a very interesting question about ownership. I guess I um, hmm. I was eager to ask Luke a question today and then I'm glad that it came up in your presentation as well but last last night I was double checking the rules for the quilt national application and on that application part of their website it says like do you want to have a solo show with us and then you click the link and they have all the details and the artist has to pay all of the expenses for shipping both ways and it's just like to me that seems like a lot a lot of expense landing on the artist instead of the institution that is charging admission and other things. And huh. I've had other opportunities to do solo shows and I like keep wanting someone to pay the expenses instead of me having to pay the expenses. And so, you know, I loved Luke, how you reframed it and said, at least it's only a couple hundred dollars because if I was a painter, it would be massively more expensive and things would be much more likely to get broken. and there's this big pile up of problems um but i also you know kind of in connection to that i noticed by reading my email last night that luke has started a patreon community and there's you um, yeah you've got you've got two people so far and it's amazing and such a generous program and platform that you have set up and like ways that build on each other so people can maybe one day own a quilt from you and um, 
you know, on it, you write about why you want to have one and so that it can support other things. And I think a lot of people, when they look at the price tag of a quilt or even that question of like libs, are you allowed to sell that quilt that you made with children and other people and community? And if you're not getting revenue from somewhere, how can you pay all of the huge expenses of buying the supplies and pay? Like I got a free booth because I'm doing lectures at the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show and I'm trying to, I'm spending a ton of money just to yeah. make the most of having this free $1,500 booth. And like the push and pull of money in ways that people never see the backstory. Like people don't know the hundreds of dollars that Luke had to pay out of his own pocket to be in just that one show. And then you're talking about a show a month and I'm like adding up the thousands yeah. of dollars and paperwork. Yeah. And like, maybe you never make a cent from all those shows, but you have to make money in other ways then to support it. And it's just to me really fascinating and something that I think is a complex part of that conversation that doesn't show up on the surface. Yeah. Yeah, for so. sure. But yeah, it's just okay. amazing to me that you're spending all that money to do shows. And I was like, ah, maybe I won't put this at the top maybe of my no. to-do list. Like, I don't have that kind of, no. And I think that's what's great about things like Patreon, where you are, you know, getting some funding from other quilters to support your work so that you can do shows. I can, Patreon helps to pay for my studio space. So now I've got a de dedicated space to hold all my work and to do my work. Um, and I'm actually able to buy groceries for my family once in a while, which is really helpful too. But I don't, I feel like also there's sometimes this idea that, you know, people will be like, oh, Libs, you're the, a rock star quilter. And I'm like, I'm just treading water here, just trying to pay the bills. <laughs> I owe a lot of taxes this year. Like, but so every, every person who signs up to my Patreon, even if it's $3, I'm like, that's like, thank you. That really, it all adds up and really helps support the work that we do as artists. So yeah, when an opportunity comes up to do a show and if you do have to pay for shipping or whatever, uh, at least there are people backing you up and helping yeah. to support you, you know, and as quilters, if other quilters are supporting you, they're also supporting our whole community by getting your work out there to be seen by people who aren't in our community. So I think there are only benefits to, to things like Patreon and Nook and, yeah. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of variables that are, as you said, Heidi, secret <laughs> to all of the, <laughs> the things, right? Like yeah. um, shows, uh, you know, galleries, museums, like, you know, museums um, by and large don't give you money to show your work. Um, they will often have money for the shipping, but people are like, oh, you did a great show, like, cool. And they're like, yeah, great. You know, all that means is my work is not in my house for six months to two years. Like, and that's and then like and that's so like that's the sort of top of it but then you're like okay because it's in that museum i can leverage that to impress other people who actually buy the objects and like the objects they buy maybe don't ever get to see the light of day they're you know sort of um betting on your future value and there's just a lot of a lot of variables that are um definitely not on the surface of uh you know a lot of people don't know that galleries take 50 percent, right if you see some object yeah, in the gallery and it says five thousand dollars on it you think holy cremoli that's you know a lot of money we don't have that necessarily sitting around but then you think okay well half of that goes to the artist uh minus maybe framing fees shipping fees uh and so you know it's like all of a sudden you're just like oh you know the, the, the artist makes two grand for an object that took them a month two months so i mean a, a month salary Plus, like a lot grand. of emails back and forth and time oh, not sewing to Lord coordinate that, that exchange sure. <laughs> and so you know, like a five thousand dollars something at a gallery gives the artist one month at two thousand which doesn't cover uh full living expenses currently in yeah. most places so like you know it's like these sticker shocks uh you know and, it's, and that's not to say that people have that money so that's another difficulty in sort of current economy. So I think these kind of subscription services are 
a brilliant way to create conversations that maybe you can jump over some of those gatekeepers. Like I've been doing a lot of shows outside of galleries and museums and it's great. It, it costs me, you know, more, but uh, you know, if I can get it funded by other ways, sell a couple quilts or, you know, Patreon at something, then I don't mind doing free shows. You know, I'm happy to, I'm happy. Look, I'm happy to pay shipping if I make enough money, right? Like if I've got enough money, then I don't mind shipping things everywhere, giving things, you know, all of that's great. And so like, that's what I'm trying to figure out. And, you know, Libs wanted to ask questions of you eventually about Patreon. It's like, you know, figuring out ways of like, look, if you come in at this much, I'll give you the things I would normally charge for, for free, you know, and like, we're, we're good. Like we meet in the middle. Um, it's just like that way I know where my, you know, written and Captain Crunch is coming from. I think that there's some really wonderful ways of creating a community that makes it even more engaging than sort of these um, shows on spec, right? I'm gonna make a bunch of things that I think are cool. I'm gonna hang it on a wall somewhere and I hope people find it and then send me a lot of money to pay my last six months that I've <laughs> that yeah, I've spent that not them. <laughs> Yeah, so. there needs to be, yeah. Patreon is my only consistent income. And every other month, and on top of that, still, I'm still like, okay, what do I need to, I need to teach a class. I need to put out a pattern. I do, need to design a fabric collection and sell some fabric from, like, there's always, it's always a, I don't want to say it's always a hustle, but it is, it's always like, how do I make ends meet? Um, but, and what's nice too, I think with things like Patreon is that it starts out as people start out as supporters, but then when you get to do the, the actual Zoom sessions with, with everyone, they become your friends. They become the people who are like, I can't wait to see you in real life or you know, um, just meeting up and chatting. It's like, especially the last during pandemic where there was, you know, it was, everyone became friends and it was like, it's been this really nice um, growth. And so on top of just being someone who's helping to support me, um, I'm hoping, you know, that I'm supporting them with my creativity or with my encouragement or knowledge or, um, yeah, creating these really great little micro communities. Well, I mean, also, how much more fun is it to have access to you on Wednesdays or Zach uh, nearly every day of the week through his nook? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that, that you kind of historically didn't, right? I mean, if everyone pays 20 bucks and supports and then they have access to you as one of 200 people, 500 people, that's very different than tens of thousands of people coming to your show at a museum who then have to buy your poster, who like, like the, yeah. the degree of separation is so much larger in sort of pre-digital artist world. And we're still trying to figure it out. Like the, it's, we're, you know, the whole thing is nebulous, but there's just so many wonderful ways of actually getting closer to people while supporting yourself better. And I think you're right, Libs, like you, you make friends, you make community, you create these kind of conversations that are so much smaller that they get to be intimate as opposed to having to have, you know, 10,000 people come through your show so that the yeah. museum can get the funding to have paid for it. Like, yeah. you know, and then much yeah. less pay, maybe. A lot more intimate, but also international, which is super cool. Yeah. Like having people from Germany and Norway and France and Australia and New Zealand, and then they join in and it's this completely different, um, yeah, just this global mini community. So I don't know. It's nice. It's good. <sighs> yeah. There is the magic in the same people getting together at regular intervals and the repetition that, that happens that really breeds some beautiful friendships and relationships. A lot of, it's funny to say, but it's, we're at the point now with the Nook that we're about to celebrate our first year anniversary coming up in November. And we're getting, I don't know, we've just reached a certain point where now people are starting to meet up in real life. Like there's, I know there's some Nook folks meet up in North Carolina and in California and different places. And it's just beautiful to see. While I'm here in Montana, I'm meeting up with a couple of people and then I'll be meeting up with some folks when I'm in LA. Yeah. It's, it's, it may start digital, but it turns out in real life, which is beautiful. I also yeah, love, and I, like, on the Nook, you've got, I think, around 500 people on there now. But if I, you know, rant, I can't make every sewing circle. 
no one but you can probably. And when I go, you know, it's around 30 people. And I like, I see some familiar faces and I know, or, you know, like I saw someone who took a class from me in Santa Fe and it was so exciting to catch up with her because we were both coincidentally in the nook that day. And like the way that it can be so big, but also very intimate that there are these small places in the nook that don't feel like 500 people and like mm -hmm. that balance is kind of amazing to me that that happens also and, there, and there's room in these spaces for like krista was saying you know several minutes back that because all of us are creators in this tent we keep making the tent bigger and what i've i've seen that dynamic at work in the nook is that like i set up sewing circles but then other people are like oh but i prefer to do sewing circles on monday morning at 8 a.m okay, you want to lead that one? I'll be still drinking my coffee, but you can lead that one or whatever. And so now people are doing their own sewing circles and I'll hop in those sometimes. It's just, it's cool. It's organic. There's, it's a lot of planning goes into it, but you also can't predict where it's going to go because it's a communal effort. Like we're, we are co-creating this thing. Yeah. And so it's sweet to, to behold. It really is. Yeah. Maybe a good segue into in our, um, sphere of being able to have everybody's schedule align. We are on softball taking softball taking next month off because Luke will be in Indonesia all month. Um, both of us are turning 40 in 2022. <laughs> so um, wow. we're, we're not going to be gone, gone, but we will be taking our first ever month off after over a year and a half of softball. A little summer vacation. Yeah, a little birthday month for the two of you. Birthday month vacation. <laughs> nice. We'll be back in October. Uh -huh. so you won't miss us for too long. Go back and watch some of those episodes you hadn't seen in a while. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we got a lot of back episodes. You got to catch up. <laughs> yeah, I have to watch more of the episodes. Yeah, it was. Yeah, Jackie's was amazing. I don't know. I love it's nice and casual. I was all nervous. I always get <laughs> nervous about public speaking, but and then I'm like, oh, there's Juta, there's Mickey. There's, I, okay, I know everybody. Like, we're yeah. just friends. But I still, it's like getting when people sing happy birthday to, to me, and I'm like, no, that I don't like to be the center of attention. But then I really kind of did this to myself, you know, like there's a part of me that does want to be the center of attention, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Well, the but minute we you. open our mouths, we become the center yeah. of attention. Yeah, exactly. But this was really fun, and I'm really happy that you invited me, and oh. it's really great to chat with everybody. Yeah. I just want to make sure no one's questions went unanswered. There's been lots of chat in the chat. Yeah, it's been a very yes. robust chat. We've had a huge crowd. It was around 160 mm -hmm. people for a while. Um, oh, Heather, my friend Kinian just commented about her in-person quilt group, and that's one of the first in-person quilt things I ever did. And she told me about the existence of the Modern Quilt Guild, and you know, my life changed because of that. That's for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, we lived sure. in the same neighborhood in Chicago for a year. Amazing. Yeah, I'm excited. It's also a good way like for people to get a hold of you if they have more questions. Mm. For me, um, I'll put this in the chat. I'll put my email, libselliot.com, studio at libselliot.com. Two T's on Elliot, please. Otherwise, it, you're, you're reaching another libs or nobody. Um, and then patreon.com slash libselliot. And then I'm, everything is libselliot, whether it's Twitter or Instagram. I'm, on Facebook, but I'm not on Facebook. You know what I mean? Like I don't check it very often. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I'm on Instagram all the time. But if you have like a specific question or you need my attention, my email is the best way to, to find me. So yeah. Yeah, we'll be connected to your Patreon and your website and the comments on YouTube. And that's a wonderful place to add comments oh, yeah. to if you're that's watching great. the recording as most people do. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe and add a comment. And I, I for sure check in on YouTube fairly often and reply to things. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone.
Have a lovely Tuesday. <laughs> Y'all enjoy your summer vacation. Enjoy your month off. I know we will. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's hang around for just a 